Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, a professional photographer for about 25 years now, video creator for more than a decade, and I'm going to teach you everything about the iPhone camera. Now, I know you know how to take a picture with your iPhone, but there are so many things you don't know, how to rapidly get pictures and video, how to zoom in and out really quickly, things like exposure compensation, manual controls, and they will make a huge difference in your photos. I'm gonna show you how to do astrophotography, night photography, how to use lots of cool gadgets like tripod mounts, video creator, still photos, I'm gonna show you everything you should know. Let's get started with all the different ways there are to open your camera. Now I'm gonna put my camera on this little tripod here. When your phone is locked, just press and briefly hold and tap the camera button down there to launch the camera. When your phone is unlocked, swipe from the upper left to bring down your notifications, and then the camera button appears in the lower right. Launch it just like before. A better way to do it is to swipe from the upper right and bring down the control center. Press the camera button briefly to launch the camera or press and hold to get a variety of different options like immediately choose taking a selfie, recording a video, or taking a portrait. Hi. There's also a secret button. You can double tap the back of the phone to launch the camera. I'll show you how to do that. Go into settings, accessibility, touch, and then scroll down to back tap. Now you can choose shortcuts for double tapping or triple tapping the back of your phone to open something up. It could be anything, but in this case, we'd want it to be the camera. Let's select double tap and then camera Maybe for triple tapping, we wanna select that, then scroll down until we see camera video and select that. With that turned on, if I double tap the back of the phone, the camera launches. If I triple tap it, the video launches and starts recording. Here's the downside, it doesn't actually work that reliably. And sometimes it will launch when you don't want it to, like it just detects some double tap. And for that reason, I don't actually use it, but I think it's cool, so I wanted to show it to you. The last way to do it is just to tell Siri to open the camera. Hey Siri, open the camera and it opens the camera. Now I'm gonna show you all the different ways to take a picture. I know you know how to push that button, but there are other things you can do with that button. Besides just pressing it to take a photo, you can press and hold and it will take a quick video. When you release, it stops recording the video. What if you wanna take a longer video and you don't wanna swipe over to the video mode? Just press and drag it over to the lock button and now it will keep recording a longer video. Drag that shutter button up and you'll record a video with zoom capability so you can zoom in and out. What if you're shooting action like sports? You can take a burst of super high speed photos by dragging that shutter button to the left. Watch this. I gotta make my little guy dance a little bit. Now if I click those photos in the lower left, you'll see the iPhone shows it as a burst. At the bottom of the screen, I can hit select here and then browse through which of the frames I really like. Whichever ones are sharp and capture the action, I touch the lower right there to mark it. When I'm ready, I click done in the upper right corner and then I can keep only those favorites and delete the rest of the pictures. That way, they're not all using up my storage. I wish my big sports cameras had that feature. You can also use the volume up and down buttons as shutter buttons. By default, either volume button will take a picture. Just press it to snap. And if you're in video mode, Pressing it will start recording a video. That's really useful when you're taking a selfie and you have it way out at arm's length and you can't easily like reach the screen. You can also go into the settings and configure the volume up button to take a burst of photos like we just did. So let's go into the settings. I'm scrolling down to camera and then I'm selecting use volume up for burst. Now when I go back to the camera, if I push the volume up button here, it's taking a burst of photos. You can see it count on the shutter button at the bottom. What about those times when you wanna take a selfie with your friends and you've propped it up against something and you wanna run into the group? You wanna set a timer, right? That's really easy to do. Push the little arrow at the top and then at the bottom, hit the timer icon. You might have to scroll left to right to find it. Timer. And now I can select how long I want the timer to be, three seconds or 10 seconds. Now when I push the shutter, it's going to count down. You can see the flash flashes just so you can keep count and you know when exactly you need to smile. Okay, the timer's cool, but you end up like running back and forth if you wanna get a few pictures. If you're an Apple Watch user like myself, there's a camera app that is absolutely amazing. Check this out. I'm going to open the camera and now I have a remote view through my iPhone. And when I push the shutter, it will take a picture. This is such a powerful tool, not just for snapshots of your family, but when I create videos and I film myself like this, I can see the composition here. And that allows me to use the back cameras on the iPhone, which are much more powerful than the front selfie cameras. In other words, you can take much higher quality selfies using the camera app here. Not only can you take stills, but you can select video or cinematic video. This also means that with your phone, if 
you're holding it out uh, really low or at some awkward position or you're holding it flat like this where you wouldn't normally be able to see the screen, maybe you're doing a top-down photo, just launch your camera app and then you can see exactly what you're composing. See, you thought you knew everything about your iPhone camera, but there's so much depth to it. Let's talk about all the different picture controls that you have that really allow you to control the exact style of the picture that you take. Of course, you know if your camera doesn't focus on the right thing, you can tap to focus. But once you tap to focus, you can drag up or down to adjust the exposure. This is known as exposure compensation. You can also tap the upper left to turn the flash on and off. The low light pictures on this are so good. You really never need to use the flash. It's just a portable flashlight for me nowadays. Another cool feature, photographic styles. These are like Instagram filters, but they apply while you're taking the picture. They only allow you to adjust a couple of things. I'll show you how. Push this little arrow at the top here. At the bottom, click the thing that looks like a stack of papers. Now you can swipe through all the different photographic styles. Note that each has unique values for tone and warmth at the bottom. If you like this, for example, but you wish it were a little warmer, you can adjust that. Now, by default, all your pictures will have those different settings. If you want to turn that back off, just go back to standard. While we're in that little menu that you access by pushing the down arrow up there, you'll notice the four to three. This is your aspect ratio. By choosing this, you can switch to square or a 16 by nine aspect ratio. Aspect ratio mathematically is the ratio between the height and the width. So four by three means it is basically like four inches wide by three inches tall or vice versa, depending on how you're holding the camera. 16 by nine is the format you're watching this video in. The phone achieves these different aspect ratios by just cropping the native four by three aspect ratio. The reason you might want to change the camera's aspect ratio is that it helps you visualize the crop. So if you are shooting for a square format, for example, you're shooting something for your Instagram grid and you just wanna preview it, set that aspect ratio to one to one. I use the 16 by nine aspect ratio when I'm making thumbnails for this channel. Now let's talk about the lenses on the back of your camera. This is gonna vary depending on the camera model that you have. The pro models usually have three lenses. The iPhone 12 and 13 will just have two lenses and then the iPhone SE just has one lens. If your phone has more than one lens, you'll notice these numbers at the bottom that allow you to quickly switch between those zooms. Using these buttons is a really smart thing to do. Yes, you could pinch and pull to zoom in, but when you pinch a little bit like this, it's taking the widest angle lens and then cropping in until the point when you crop to the point where you go past the next lens and then it seamlessly switches between the lenses. But whenever you're cropping like this, you're losing detail. So if you start with the 0.5 lens and crop to 0.9 where it's not quite tight enough to switch to the 1x lens, you're cropping from the original 12 megapixels to more like three megapixels. So you could see if you were at 0.9, it would actually give you a lot more detail if you were to zoom all the way to 1x. I pretty much just switch between those and never pinch and zoom. And then I will adjust my distance to the subject or change my composition to try to get as much detail as possible. If you notice those three apertures, 15, 6.8, and 24, well, 6.8 is a much lower f-stop number. And in f-stops, it's very confusing, but lower is always really better. That means that the wide lens is gathering way, way more light than the other two lenses. It's gathering about four times more light than the ultra-wide lens and about 16 times more light than the telephoto lens. So which of those do you think would do better in low-light conditions? Of course, the wide lens with the lowest f-stop is going to do the best in low-light conditions. You need this, Stunning Digital Photography. It's the number one photography book in the world for the last decade, and I happen to have written it. It has more than 20 hours of video in it. It's a very unique video book format. The ebook is only $9.99, and you can just watch the videos. It has tons of practices that will improve your photography, and it's written for people using real cameras like this, or smartphones, or drones. There's a lot to the art and science of photography that I'm not gonna cover here, so go to northrop.photo now and pick this up. Now I'm gonna go into more detail about live photos. When you turn on live photos, the iPhone captures a series of photos in rapid succession. It can then blend those photos together or pick a particular frame where it thinks everything is sharpest and people are smiling. Turn it on or off by clicking the upper right corner. 
Here are some tips to use it. It actually records like a short video each time you take a picture. You can hold down the photo to view the entire video. So here's a selfie I took earlier of my new haircut. If I just hold it like this, it's gonna play back as a short video. Some caveats, it records stuff before and after you press the shutter. So don't be holding the camera, pointing at something personal and private and then whip it around and take your photo real quick and push the shutter. You wanna like hold the camera steady for a good full second before and after pressing the shutter. Here's a photo of my wife and I kayaking with our dog Pixel. If I click live in the upper left here, I can set it to loop and that's gonna convert it into a video that just cycles through over and over again. If I convert it to bounce, the video plays forward and then backwards, bouncing back and forth. Or I can convert it to long exposure. And if I convert it to long exposure, each image is averaged. Now in this case, that made the picture all blurry because people were moving around. But if you were to put your iPhone on a tripod and take a long exposure of something like a waterfall, it would stack that together to smooth out the waterfall. It can be a really, really cool effect. Now let's talk a little bit about using raw photos on your camera. If you're a photographer watching my channel, you might know how to use raw files. You'll see in the upper right corner, there is a little icon there for turning raw on and off. Now it will save your raw photo in addition to the JPEG or heck photo that it's taking. If you don't see that, go into settings, camera, formats, and select Apple Pro Raw. This doesn't mean you're recording raw for everything, it just puts that little control in the upper right corner. Once you turn raw photos on, you can process them in Lightroom. I wrote a book about Lightroom too, which you can get at Northrop.photo, and again, it has training videos in it, or you can just buy the book itself. Here's Lightroom in action. First, I'll turn raw on and take a picture. Then I'll open Lightroom. I'll add the photo from my camera roll. You can see it's marked as DNG, that's digital negative. Let's import one DNG and one HEC file, and then I'll add it. This is the HEC file, and this is the DNG file. You can see the file name there. Now I can edit it. I'm gonna go to Light down here, and I can adjust the exposure. And you can see on the raw file, when I adjust the exposure, I can peek in the shadows of my studio there. I can bring down the highlights. I can bring up the shadows. I don't want this to be a full lesson on raw editing. I just wanted to give you a taste so that you might go and pick up my Lightroom book and learn how to edit raw taken with your iPhone. It really is a powerful tool. Now let's talk about portrait mode. I absolutely love this feature. This gives you control over a virtual aperture, allowing you to shoot with what on this camera is like a 75 millimeter F1.4 lens. So let's open up the camera and switch to portrait mode. By the way, you can switch between all these modes by touching down here or by just swiping left and right. Depending on the camera model you have, you can switch between different zooms in the lower left corner. Here it's at 1x, and here it's at 3x, much tighter. This is weird, because when you're in photo mode, the zoom is right in the middle, but when you're in portrait mode, it pushes it off to the left, so it's kind of easy to miss that. In portrait mode, you also have these different lighting options that you can scroll through in real time. I pretty much always just shoot in natural light. You can go back and change the lighting options in post, in post-processing after you take your picture. Now I'm gonna pull up a portrait I took previously so that we can see how the editing process works. Here's a picture of my wife, Chelsea. I'll click edit at the top, and now at the bottom you can see I can adjust the different lighting options to just pick, just pick the one you like. And then I can slide this left to right to adjust how much that changes it. Because by default, I think it's always a little too much. I always dial it back just a little bit. There's other adjustments at the bottom here, but we'll talk about those later because they're just general post-processing. Right now we're just talking about the portraits. In the upper left corner here, you'll see the aperture. If I select that, it allows me to control the aperture. Using a lower f-stop number gives me more background blur. That's f1.4. Using a higher f-stop number brings the background into focus. That's f16. Lots of background blur, what people call bokeh, is very cool but there can be some flaws. So before you share a picture at F1.4, I would go ahead and just zoom in. Just check carefully, because along the edges, sometimes you can see some really weird kind of artifacts. Like look here at the edge of her sweater. It kind of processed that weird. Probably nobody would notice on Instagram or social media, but if you're trying to be a professional photographer, you'd probably want to avoid those sorts of artifacts. Now let's talk about panoramas. A panorama stitches an image together while you pan your camera. So the image becomes very wide angle, but also higher megapixel than your original image. So it's great for shooting ultra wide. If you don't happen to have an ultra wide lens, it's also great for adding more detail. 
I'll show you quickly how to use it. At the bottom, I'm gonna to scroll to Pano. You can see it's instructing me to scroll from left to right across the entire imaging area. I have the usual options. If you have multiple lenses, you can switch between those. You wanna leave room at the edges of the frame for cropping later. So I'm gonna pan way left, and then I'll hit the shutter, and then I'll gradually pan to the right. I'm watching that white arrow and trying to keep it in the middle. Sometimes you see it will instruct me to slow down. And when I'm done, I press stop. Now I have this ultra wide angle shot, which, well, it looks a little distorted. Panoramas are almost always a little distorted. They're better for landscapes and such. If you wanna shoot right to left instead of left to right, tap that and you can see it flips around. You can also do vertical panoramas. Either shoot from bottom to top or top to bottom. As I scroll through my panoramas, you can see I usually use them for extremely wide angle views. Here's a vertical panorama that includes the sunset and my feet. Now let's talk about the different video modes. I'll open the camera up again and swipe to go to video here. Now in the upper right corner, you can see I have mine set to 4K 60. I can tap these. Tapping 4K switches between HD and 4K. Tapping 60 switches between 24, 30, and 60. HD is lower res. That's 1080 lines of resolution. It was the standard five or 10 years ago, and it's probably plenty resolution. That's the default. 4K is four times HD. That's what newer TVs are. That's capturing as much resolution as it can, about eight megapixels per video frame. For me, I'm always gonna use 4K. It uses more storage, but my iPhone has plenty of storage and I have cloud backup, so I never end up filling up my phone anyway. The frame rate is a key decision. I always film at 60 frames per second. I like it because it's nice and smooth. I think it's the format of the future but I also like the ability to slow things down. Sometimes in my YouTube videos, I'll take a 60 frames per second segment and slow it down to half speed. Half speed is good for stretching out a video clip if you need to cover some voiceover, or it can provide that sort of romantic feeling that you see in all those pharmaceutical ads. 24 frames per second is the standard for film or TV in places like Europe, pal. And 30 frames per second is the standard for most of YouTube videos and American TV. If you want a higher frame rate for slow motion, there is a separate mode for that. Just scroll over to slow-mo here. Now you can see at the upper right, it's shooting at HD 1080 and 240 frames per second. So if I record something here, it's going to allow me to really slow it down. As before, I can touch the frame rate in the upper corner to switch between 240 and 120, but I can't go to 4K in slow-mo. That's slow motion, but what about fast motion? What we would call a time lapse, where you wanna show a longer period of time. You might stick the iPhone to your dashboard and do a time lapse of a drive to convey the different scenery that you saw over the course of an hour. Or you might prop it up and watch the sunset so that you could drop that into a video if you're transitioning from daytime to nighttime. To select the time lapse, it's the last option here. There aren't really any other options, just hit the record button to start the time lapse and then just let it go as long as you want. You don't have to worry about any settings or anything. When you're done, hit the stop button here. I have professional time lapse equipment and I still so frequently use my phone for that type of storytelling because it's just so easy and reliable and no additional post processing. Apple has hidden some video settings like your codec. So let's go into the settings, open camera, the top option here, formats. You'll see an option for Apple ProRes. If I turn that on, it records an Apple ProRes, and if you don't know what Apple ProRes is, don't even sweat it. I don't use Apple ProRes. It's this like very high professional oriented codec. It's designed to make it easy to edit the video, but it consumes a massive amount of storage space. But frankly, I don't have any problem with editing the natural video format that is much more highly compressed, so I don't turn it on. But I did want to show you where that option was. You also have the camera capture option here, which applies to both stills and video. You can choose high efficiency or most compatible. Most compatible uses older formats like JPEGs and H.264. High efficiency is actually Actually higher quality as well as lower storage space and unless you're having a compatibility problem with some old editing app you're using you wouldn't need to switch it. Now let's talk about how to get great sound when you're recording video. The on-camera mic here is pretty good and most people just use that. You can also use your AirPods and it will use the little AirPod as a microphone. You can also connect a traditional microphone like these wireless Rode Labs using a USB-C to lightning cable. There are quite a few microphones that are compatible with this. Right now I'm using the Rode Wireless Go 2 microphones and the great thing about these is they record the sound to MP3 files locally. So I don't need to set up anything on my phone. I can just download the audio file directly from the mic here 
synchronize it in my video editing app and get great sound without connecting any microphone to my phone. Now I wanna show you how to shoot cinematic video. This video allows you to bring in that bokeh, that nice background blur that we saw in portrait mode, but it works in video mode and it's actually really amazing. It has some limitations though. I've switched to cinematic mode here. Notice even though I have three lenses, I don't get to choose them here. I just have the 1X lens. So now I'll hit record. I'll put some glasses in the background so there's something for us to think about. He can interact with the glasses. He can come back in here. Now that we've recorded some action, I'll press stop review the video, and then I'll tap edit. Here I'm in the cinematic editor. Let's scrub through to where we can see something in the background there. In the upper left corner here, you'll see F2.8, just like when we were in portrait mode. This adjusts the virtual aperture. So I can adjust this down to F2 to increase the background blur or bring it up to F16 to decrease the background blur. So you see how the background blur is changing there? I can also change the focus after I film the video. You have to think a little bit differently. You don't have to change focus while you're filming. So now it's focused on the face. I can now switch the focus to the glasses here. And you can see the glasses came into focus and the face here went out of focus. So you can add multiple points. Like here I'm focused on the glasses and then I can scrub forward a little bit and pull focus back to my guy. And then as I play it back, you can see the cinematic mode actually pulls focus in and out. Of course, you can adjust the brightness and stuff just like you normally could. You can also apply these really cool filters that really do provide a very cinematic feel to it. The biggest limitation is it only films in 1080 at 24 frames per second. Now I'm gonna talk about tripods because it's a really fundamental part of being a photographer is having camera support for things like long exposures for having a still video. Putting your smartphone on a tripod used to be a pain. You'd have to use these clamps that would often like press the lock buttons. With MagSafe on the iPhone 12 and 13s, it opens up the opportunity for this variety of magnetic tripod that allows you to snap it on and off really quickly. What I've been using here is a portable tripod from Peak Design. Look how small this is. It's about the size of a credit card. I mean, thicker than a credit card. And it unfolds to have three legs. This part is magnetic and if you have a MagSafe phone like this, you can just snap it right on there. And it works in both horizontal and vertical as you've seen. If you have an iPhone 11, Peak Design also sells a case and the case is MagSafe compatible. So your iPhone 11 users will be able to take advantage of MagSafe, not for charging, but at least for sticking it to things. Another Peak Design tool here is this action camera mount which basically turns this into a GoPro. If you have the Peak Design case for any of the phones, it will snap in there and it won't let go. So you can see now that it's in there, I can just do that and it won't come off. You can see the mount here is very much like a GoPro and is GoPro compatible. Another MagSafe option I really like is Moment. Moment actually adds a cold shoe. So you could snap a microphone in there if you wanted to or a light. And just like Peak Design, it snaps on with MagSafe and allows you to rotate to both horizontal and vertical. With this in a tripod, it's really easy to do mobile vlogging, especially in cinematic mode. It looks great. For those traditional photographers who want to use an ND filter or a polarizing filter, Moment has options for that too. This specifically fits the back of the iPhone 12 and 13, I think, and just sort of covers up the lenses and fastens on there. Now, I'm going to lower the lights a little bit and talk about night photography with the iPhone. It's very dim in here. When the iPhone notices it's dark, it adds this icon in the upper left corner. That's for long exposures. If I push that, it brings up the night options. You can see here, I can drag it right or left. You see, when I take a picture handheld, I need to try to hold it as still as possible for that full second. I can scroll down here and turn it off and take a single photo. If you compare those two photos, the one second exposure is much cleaner, but it gets better than that. Let's put it on a tripod. When the iPhone detects that it's on a tripod, it will allow you to do even longer exposures up to a full 30 seconds. That allows you to do astrophotography that looks like this. Really cool, right? So now you can experiment with astrophotography without having to spend thousands of bucks on a camera. Let's talk about underwater photography. Your iPhone is waterproof, so you could just jump in the pool, take some stills or video up to a certain depth and a certain length. Usually it's like six feet under for 30 minutes. I don't actually recommend it though because I have done that and it will work. But a bunch of water gets in your lightning port here and if you try to charge it, you could actually break your phone and if the water does ruin your phone, that's not gonna be covered under warranty. So I recommend getting a waterproof case if you plan on any of that, but in a pinch, it can work just fine. Let's talk about using manual mode. 
A lot of photographers want to be able to control their shutter speed and ISO and maybe even their aperture. I'm going to show you how to do some of that using Lightroom. Open up Lightroom and then click the camera icon there. Then in the bottom left there, make sure you select professional. This gives you manual controls. Now you'll notice there's no aperture control here. You cannot control the aperture because the lenses physically don't have an adjustable aperture. If you want to control things like background blur, you need to go into portrait mode on the standard camera and then it will do what they call foca, like a fake bokeh. But with this manual camera open, I can adjust the shutter speed all the way up to one ten thousandth of a second and all the way down to one second. Now notice I can't do a 10 second, I can't do a 30 second exposure. However, you can get stacking apps that simulate longer exposures by capturing a series of say one second photos and then averaging them together. That works pretty well for smoothing out the water in a waterfall or something, but I will say there's always a little gap between each of those frames and you can see little bits of repeated patterns. So it's not perfect. Long exposures are still one weakness. You can also adjust the ISO here. So basically these two settings together will allow you to control the brightness of your photo. Lastly, you can adjust the white balance. If you screw it up, just hit reset there and it will go back. Now I'm going to share my tips and tricks for editing your photos and videos. I think every photo that you share should be edited at least a little bit and the iPhone makes all of that incredibly easy. Open it up in the photos app and then you can tap edit in the upper right corner. At the bottom here, you can either trim your live photo or trim your video. The controls work exactly the same. This way, if you're sharing a live video and you don't want to share the beginning or end of it, you can just drag it in like that. If it's a live photo, you'll see the frame that the iPhone thought was the best. The iPhone did a poor job of picking out that keyframe, so I'm just going to move it back and pick the frame I like the best. There we go. And then I'll select make key photo. Going to the settings here, I can tap auto on or off. Auto almost always improves the photo just by adjusting the exposure and contrast and such to the way that the iPhone thinks looks good. I usually use that as a starting point. And then I'll scroll to the right through all these different values and adjust them. Exposure adjusts the overall brightness of the image. Brilliance adds local contrast, basically making things glow. Highlights adjust just the brightest part of the image, making them brighter or making them darker. If you have a really high contrast scene where everything is bright and dark, you might try bringing the highlights down, bringing the shadows up, and then adjusting the exposure to balance it. Shadows here adjust the darkest parts of the picture, like the black fur in my dog there. When you increase the contrast, you take the highlights and the shadows and separate them. When you decrease the contrast, you push everything towards the middle. Here we see increasing the contrast makes the highlights bright and the shadows dark. Decreasing the contrast makes the entire image flat. Here we see brightness, which is very similar to exposure. Let's talk about the black point and the white point. The values in a photo typically have a value from 0 to 255. 255 is bright white. 0 is completely black. You can adjust the point at which everything below it is black, from say 0 to 10. And if you do that, basically the blacks are clipped. Let's zoom in on my dog pixel here, and if we lower the black point, we can see the detail actually comes up. And if we drop it, you can see those details get clipped and details that were in the shadow are now completely lost. The saturation controls how rich colors are. Go all the way to the left and it'll be black and white. Go all the way to the right and it'll be, well, way too much. Vibrance is very similar to saturation, but it tends to be a little bit more intelligent in that it won't overexpose certain colors. For example, look at the way these oranges and reds are with the saturation up to 100. If I bring the vibrance up to 100, you can see they're much more muted. So vibrance is generally superior to use over saturation. The warmth slider shifts the entire color color balance from either warm reds or cool blues and greens. If I slide it to the warm side, it looks like a nice summer day, maybe sunrise or sunset. And if I slide it to the cool side, everything becomes more blue and it actually feels a little bit colder. While warm adjusts the color balance from reds to blues, the tint adjusts the color balance between magentas and greens, like greens and purples. So if I slide it this way, everything becomes kind of green. And if I slide it this way, everything becomes kind of purple. I usually adjust the warmth to set the mood of the photo, and I'll adjust the tint more to fix any imbalanced color. Sharpness exaggerates lines of contrast. For example, if there's an area that goes from white to black, it actually makes the whites at that edge a little brighter and the blacks at that edge a little darker. So if your picture's a little unsharp, you can try raising the sharpness. You really don't want to do this on a portrait, somebody's face, because it would just accentuate all their wrinkles. Definition is similar to sharpness, but more intelligent. Let's talk about the noise reduction setting. In low light environments, you'll see little speckles, what some people compare to film grain. 
This is just noise when the camera does not get enough light. The iPhone will naturally try to remove all of that and does a pretty good job. But if you still see some noise and you want it to be a little more blurry rather than speckled, increase the noise reduction. Vignettes darken the corners. This happens naturally with lenses like this, particularly with older lenses. So it is a good way to make a image seem vintage. It's also a good way to bring your attention to the center of the image. Drag it to the left and it adds a white vignette. White vignettes are awful. You should probably never use them. Drag it to the right and it will add a dark vignette. The next value at the bottom here are filters. You can just flip through these and choose the one that you like. Once you find one you like, you can dial it back a little bit at the bottom. All these filters are a little heavy handed, so I almost always end up dialing them back to 75, 50, 25%. And finally, the last value here is cropping. Of course, you could crop out things that you didn't like. You could change the aspect ratio using the button in the upper right corner here. This would allow you to change it to square, 16 by nine, four by five, five by seven. When adjusting the aspect ratio, you also have tools at the bottom that allow you to switch between horizontal and vertical. Here's a hint. Instagram photos are best in four by five vertical. That just takes up the most space as somebody is scrolling through, but your grid looks best in one by one. If the image needs to be rotated to the side, push this button multiple times until it is rotated correctly. The cropping tool also allows you to provide perspective correction. This is especially useful if you're looking up at a tall building, you can adjust it some to straighten it out. So it's useful for real estate and architectural photography. For example, here's a church in Iceland. Let's go in and correct the perspective distortion. First, I would level it. Notice the grid line appears. I'm gonna line up the horizon. Now I could correct the vertical distortion. Because I'm below the middle of the building, I'll need to tilt it towards me like this. Now I can correct the horizontal distortion. You can also edit any of your photos on your MacBook. If you have your photos turned on to synchronize to the iCloud, something you have to pay for storage for, you can go into the Photos app on your Mac, open up a photo, and then click Edit. You get access to the same tools you have on your phone, but I sometimes find it so nice to be able to work on the bigger screen with a keyboard, and the fact that it can synchronize automatically is really helpful. I'll show you how to turn on that automatic synchronization. Go to your name where it says iCloud. Go to iCloud. And then under photos, turn this on. Notice that I have optimized iPhone storage turned on. Whenever my phone starts to fill up, it's gonna just keep only thumbnails of the images in the phone itself so I don't fill up all my device storage. And whenever I go to access a photo, assuming it has an internet connection, it'll download it again from the cloud. This iCloud is what allows it to automatically transfer from my phone to my computer, to my tablet, or any other device. You know, before we had this, my daughter wrecked her phone and she lost all of the photos she had on it. There was no backup of it and she was just really devastated. So now I sleep a little easier knowing that the iCloud has a constant backup of everything. Now let's talk about how to organize your photos. When you pull up a photo, push the little heart at the bottom here to add it to your favorites. Now you can access all of your favorites from your favorites album. Down at the bottom here, select albums, go back to all albums, and then pretty close to the top here, you'll see favorites. I have the truly important photos like my family and my truck, but I also have things like pictures of my vaccine card that I might need to show to go into a restaurant, pictures of my passport in case I lose it while traveling. I have those marked as favorites so I can quickly find them in the future. The iPhone will also detect people, but it doesn't know your friend's names, so you might have to go in and add them manually. Pull up any photo with faces in it, and if the iPhone sees it, it'll show it to you when you tap the I button at the bottom here. Now you can see these four faces here. I've named all these, which is why it says photos of Chelsea here. The last face here doesn't have a name. You can see that because it has a little question mark. So if I tap that, it will prompt me to tag it with a name. In the future, it can automatically recognize people that you tag, but it is good to go back and double check. Now that you've tagged some people, this is so cool. You'll see people in places, tap people here, and you can see all the people that you've tagged. This way, if you wanna go back and just find uh, pictures of your friend, Lewis, you can see all the pictures, you can see the places that you've been, and if there are photos that it's not sure about, you can click review and confirm whether or not that is Lewis in the photos. The iPhone automatically creates some albums for you and they're pretty useful. Let's scroll through them. First, different apps can create folders, like I have an app called PhotoScan, DJI Works, they Snapseed, they create their own folders. You can also see all these albums organized by media type. Videos, selfies, long exposures, panoramas. I wanna find this panorama that I took. I can just click that and scroll through all the different panoramas that I've made. You can also make custom albums, either for your own organizational purposes or to share them. Pick a couple of photos. I'm gonna click select here and I'll just pick a couple of random photos. 
and then I'll click the share button and, and I'll either add them to a shared album or add them to an album. So let's do a shared album here. Type a name for it, select the shared album, and then pick who you want to share it with. Now I can go under albums and under shared albums, I'll see the album that I just created. And if I shared it with somebody else, they'll see that whole album too, and they can add to it. So if you're taking a family trip with a few people and you all have iPhones, create a shared album for that trip, Morocco 2022. And then you can each put your favorite pictures in there. And at the end, you'll have enough to maybe make a photo book. Another great way to share photos is with AirDrop. AirDrop uses Wi-Fi to transfer your photos from an iPhone to a Mac or a tablet or pretty much any other Apple device, but Android phones wouldn't support it. Hit the share button like you normally would. Pick the device and that's the recognition of AirDrop and it's coming through. Recording videos like this, I'll get video with my iPhone, transfer it with AirDrop to my MacBook, drop that right into Final Cut, which I use to edit videos and I'm on my way. You can also use AirPlay to share photos or videos with a TV or computer. So it's a way to make a quick slideshow. Here's my dog Pixel excited to go in the truck. I'm going to share it. I'm going to select AirPlay. And you can see now I could choose between two different MacBooks, or if you have a TV with AirPlay set up, it'll show up there too. I'll select that and I got an error message. It's AirPlay, I actually find it to be really unreliable. Sometimes it does work. I wanted to show you how it would work if it did. Now let's talk about how to find your photos. I'll go to albums and then under people and places, I can do places. And now it's gonna show me a map of the world. So if I know I wanna find a picture in Chicago, I just need to zoom in there. And you see, I can just keep zooming in. Look, here we are in Lake Michigan. I know we took a boat ride, so this would be a really quick way to find pictures of us on the boat. This is gonna blow your mind. You can also search for photos by subject. In the lower right corner, there's a little search icon here, so I'll push that. And now I can search for a dog. I like dogs. I have 688 photos of dogs, so I'll click see all here. And you're gonna see all these photos of dogs that I've taken. You can search for license plate. If you took a picture of your car in a parking lot because you want to remember where in the parking garage you were, it'll, it'll find it. You could search for skis or boat or house, whatever you can imagine, you can search for it and probably find it. It's not 100%, it's artificial intelligence, but the fact that that organization happens automatically, I find that so useful for digging up old photos. I hope this has been helpful. I know it was a lot, trust me, I am really tired. I have some tea here to help with my voice. If you want to thank me, subscribe to this channel. It's completely free. You'll be notified of new camera reviews that we have, new tutorials like this. I'll teach you the art and science of photography completely free. You can also use a like on this. Don't forget to bookmark it and come back because I know there was a lot to take in in just one session. I'd also ask you to visit our store at northrop.photo where we have so much fantastic photography education for sale. That's how we actually make our living. We wrote the number one photography book in the world for the last decade, Stunning Digital Photography. It's number one because it's continually updated. I updated this just last year to accommodate drones and smartphones as well as traditional cameras like this. No matter what type of tool you use for imaging, I've got you covered here. It's not just a book but it has 20 hours of video in it. Short little five minute video so you can learn one specific thing quickly and then practice it using the built-in practices. You get access to a Facebook group for support for other people reading this book. They can give you feedback on your images and help you improve. You can also use our Lightroom training to use Lightroom right on your phone to do your photo editing, which will make such a huge difference in your imaging. And we have more in-depth training there too. For example, training for professional portrait photographers to help you actually make money, the art and science of photography training on using flash systems for controlling lighting. You can get all of that at northrop.photo. Thanks, bye.